Okay, we can have the last talk for this session, and it's my pleasure to introduce Holger from the University of Stuttgart. He will give us uh, the last talk of this session on OpenStreetMap. Uh, again, you have 20 minutes, uh, five minutes for uh, questions and answers, and then we will move to the coffee break. Okay. Thank you, Marco. Um, let me introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Holger Sauter. I'm, as Daniel, at the Institute of Spatial Planning and uh, Spatial and Regional Planning at the University of Stuttgart. We're colleagues. We worked both on this topic. And as you can see at the um, title of my talk uh, now, it's related. We wanted to discover some hidden, uh, some hidden factors of OpenStreetMap, some hidden indicators. My approach was more, or the approach of this study was more from the um, bottom up to look exactly at region, at regional level, and the content of OpenStreetMap in the region of Stuttgart in contrast to the international perspective that Daniel just um, previously um, presented. So let me start with some, um, yeah, with a basic outline of the talk first. I want to give you a brief um, background on resilience, on urban resilience, because I'm not sure if in this, uh, at this conference with this technical focus or some technical um, stress on on the uh, methodology, if you're aware about the concept. Um, so a few definitions at the beginning, then I come to the research objectives, and we'll then um, introduce the methods we applied and come up with some results and conclusions. There will be a bit of redundancy, of course, because the topic is very, very similar to the one Daniel just pre uh, presented. But um, on the other hand, I'm happy I don't have to explain everything in depth because it was already explained. Okay. As I warned you, some definitions. What is resilience? Maybe you know, Holling introduced this term, this concept in 1973 by observation of ecosystems, ecological um, uh, systems with um, populations of various species. And he defined it as a measure of persistence of systems and their ability to absorb change and disturbance and still maintain the same relationship between population or state variables. So he introduced the system perspective on yeah, terms like robustness, flexibility of system. How much can a system cope before it collapses or breaks down? Um, this system perspective went into various uh, research disciplines. It's a kind of uh, yeah, buzzword nowadays in many Top, uh, in many research are arenas you find it, and it also entered many political agendas. One of its, the most important one, each of, one, each of you is aware of, is the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, where you find, at least in these four, five um, goals specifically, the term resilience in the goal. And we at the Institute, at the University of Stuttgart, um, work basically in the field of goal 13, climate action, which, uh, which uh, states that resilience has to be strengthened um, and the adaptive capacity to climate-related hazards and natural disasters has to be uh, increased. This general goal specifically um, gu guides some, more, some um, goals of the of goal 11 or some main contents of goal 11 to um, create resilient cities, sustainable cities and communities. So measuring resilience is very important in urban planning and spatial planning in this regard. So if we go a bit more specific to urban resilience, you see here your definition I like very well because the first term is very important to have a measurable, measurable ability of any urban system, yeah, and the rest is a bit like the definition of hauling. What means measurable? It means we need indicators. We need something to measure on the urban level or the regional level um, to define the state of resilience to, as Daniel explained before as well, to determine how successful measures are, uh, programs, initiatives, or even single um, infrastructures 
that are built in order to increase resilience. For example, what is the impact of this dam, of this flood prevention um, infrastructure to the overall resilience of the region? So we need these indicators and we have them already. Many, this is not a very new topic to have these indicators for resilience. So many um, regions or countries already have yeah, accepted and tested um, resilience indicator sets available, which are in use. But most of them have the shared problem. You need a lot of data because they consist of many, usually many indicators, a few dozens. Each of them uh, belongs to other um, authorities or comes from other data sources, which means different file formats, different uh, spatial resolution, different um, temporal re resolution. And so it's always a big deal to standardize, to bring it together and compute it accordingly, accordingly to an index. So we have a limited feasibility and standardization, which led us to this idea. How can we use a standardized global database, which OSM is, to derive these indicators for resilience? So, yeah, we did basically the same, almost the same as we did for the World Risk Index, with uh, four recognized resilience indicators that we yeah, derived from literature. Um, I will, ex uh, I will introduce them later on the, on the later slides. Um, and we tested s the statistical learning methods in order to deduce these resilience indicators from OpenStreetMap. So, first of all, before I go into the methods part, I want to introduce the region of Stuttgart because I'm not sure if all of you know it or know where it is and what dimension it has or it covers. We chose it because it has a very high OSM coverage and a very high uh, contribution index um, compared internationally and um, offered a sound um, data source there. So it's in Germany in the southwest in the federal state of Baden-Württemberg and uh, Baden-Württemberg consists, consists of four federal districts, one of um, which is the federal district of Stuttgart, which also um, holds the capital of the federal state Stuttgart here in the, in the southwest, um, the economical center. And as you can see at this map, that the economical um, center or uh, um, basis of this district is around Stuttgart. There are many sub-centers, Heilbronn, Ludwigsburg, and so on, with a high economical capacity, whereas the eastern part and central part of the district is really rather rural area, small municipalities, small villages, but some global players, hidden champions inside um, some of these um, municipalities. And this has some influence, as you will see, later on maps where we compare the performance of the predictors. The data pre-processing, we already heard some of this before, but we had a little different approach because we could in terms of computational power in this um, example, because the coverage on the data amount was lower. First, we downloaded the database from Geofabric and pre-processed the data, so threw out some information of the database that was not very important, like authors and so on, and um, change the information. Then we imported it into PostGIS database with OSM to PG SQL with um, yeah, the full data set, which was not clipped, not yet uh, clipped at the boundaries of the municipalities, but we wanted to have statistics for each uh, municipality, so we clip the geometries uh, with QGIS and built then in the PostGIS database again the statistic tables for all polygons and lines and points. So we had statistics for each municipality for area 
uh, length and counts, and we normalized it by population in the municipalities. This table then could be, or these tables, where there were a few, could be connected with um, the uh, package to R statistics, where we performed basically these um, methods that you already heard from Daniel. We decided random forest after testing all of them because it produced just the best outputs in comparison and deduced the indicators. What was the training data or the, the um, four indicators we've selected to be uh, predicted by the model? The four indicators were migration balance, demographic age structure, business tax revenue, and unemployment uh, representing these four dimensions. You can see on the left of resilience, dimensions, um, socioeconomic, all of them. And yeah, on the right, you see the sources of these indicators. So they are tested and uh, applied. You, as you know, um, the business tax revenue, a data set that usually each year is uh, produced. Um, others like migration balance might not be available for each commu uh, community on an annual basis and so on. So you already can uh, see at this selection that the conventional method would be rather complicated in contrast to an automized dynamic, maybe dynamic um, method that we did or developed with um, this within this study. So let me show you some results. I don't have to explain uh, the tags anymore because Marco already did. It's a basically key value pair from OpenStreetMap. Um, the tables here show the results of the different dimensions or indicators we measured, and the number MSE, the increase of the mean squared error, shows you the importance of the specific tag for the prediction of the model output. So barrier lift gate, for example, is the highest, has the highest impact on the model quality at the end, on the model prediction. If you leave it away, the mean squared error would increase accordingly uh, double as, for example, if you would leave it away, Deutsche Post, German Post. <laughs> we were surprised a bit by looking at the tags that were selected by the model that were of high importance. Some of them are obvious regarding the, the dimensions. Some of them are not, where you really wonder, but it's basically the same surprise as we had with the World Risk Index. Um, that's, that's a result or the funny thing with random forest models, you don't know what comes out. So if we have a look at, for example, tax revenues, it makes it's very clear, industrial buildings, private access and so on, land use, industrial, has a high impact as everyone would expect. But uh, when you look at unemployment, for example, the situation is completely different. What has, um, what is uh, um, uh, orchard, what has an orchard to do with unemployment, you might ask. But anyway, we didn't understand yet fully what the reasons behind these uh, lo obviously uh, logical connections are. But if you have a look at the, take a look at the maps, you really see that uh, there are, the results are quite convincing. On the left side, I will show you all the four indicators within the, ne uh, the next slides. On the left side, you see the statistical data, the conventional mapping, and on the right side, the random forest output model, and um, yeah, feeling of belonging, which uh, we measured with a migration balance. So how much people migrate in to the m municipality. You can see there's a really good coverage or a really good um, um, similarity in the southwest, in the central areas, the economically strong areas, whereas we have a bit, a bit of problem in the prediction here around this northeastern part. We didn't understand why at the beginning, but then we looked a bit into detail of the municipalities and we found out that um, here in Bad Mergentheim, we have the a large company, I don't want to name it, I don't know if that is, uh, if that is okay. So it's a big producer of screws, 
for uh, in, for industry, and it, this this economical asset pulls many people into the region, but the infrastructure around it doesn't really uh, reflect this economical um, strength of the region. So the spatial attributes not always, obviously, uh, can predict these um, special these special situations. And this difference here, or the specific issue of, of, about, uh, about these, as I main, named them before, these hidden champions that are located somewhere in rural, rural regions, um, pops up in the other results as well a few times. Not as much here with the age structure, but still, the, still one class um, left. And here with the tax revenue, the prediction is rather good. So another, the last indicator we mapped is the unemployment which also matched very well, as you can see. So it brings me already to the conclusions. Um, this method we applied, of course, it's just a first step, um, but already showed that there are really hidden attributes in OpenStreetMap regarding risk, regarding resilience, um, socioeconomic uh, topics or s social topics where the database um, was not made for, but it's still hidden there, and it's a quality of, of OpenStreetMap. We have found or proven that the method we applied is very simple. It doesn't need a big, big uh, computational power. You can uh, easily do it with a good computer. Of course, you need some patience for the <laughs> modelings, but a few days should do it. Um, it's just the first step. A lot of more research has to be done, definitely, and it's not. It, it might not be sufficient to just use such methods and just use OpenStreetMap in order to, um, yeah, have a dynamic, dynamically produced indicator. It might be also useful to have other methods include in order to pr improve the quality of the prediction. For example, remote sensing data that was that is also dynamically available could be linked with these methods. Thank you for your um, attention. That was it, and I'm free for questions. Thank you. Another great presentation. Are there questions? I mean, in in the case of Daniel's presentation, with with the sort of the vulnerability, I can see more instinctive connection to physical features with that. But with resilience, I think it's quite ex extraordinary that you get that sort of close mapping based on 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 what is mostly mapping of physical features uh, that, on the face of it, wouldn't have much to do with unemployment or migratory trends and then because some of this is just black box yeah, passing through the interesting thing here is how much uh, the the physical features that are being mapped in an area are a reflection of sort of certain issues like unemployment and stuff like that which because we're not we don't map these statistics in any way um, and then the follow-up question to that would be how do you get any feel from this from what isn't being mapped that could be mapped for these factors, what's you know because because everybody has their priorities when they do OSM mapping, they focus on certain things. But are there things coming out of this that you think should be mapped that aren't? To be honest, that's uh, both questions are tough questions and, uh, because we're not that far yet. We we uh, produced these maps rather recently, um, and we're still very surprised and the the. The point is we still don't know exactly why um, this is producing a good output or that good output, although we cannot really relate the tags to the to the topic or the the, the spatial structures to the social uh, sphere. Um, 
I just have to say, well, we will uh, get more into detail and have more, uh, a deeper look at it uh, to uncover it. Hmm? In Calgary, In Calgary maybe. <laughs> Next year, <laughs> we will show some new results <laughs> explaining exactly uh, these open questions, why, and uh, hopefully also why uh, or what else could be inter integrated to produce more results. Maybe, uh, Daniel, you have an idea for the, that question or an answer to that question. Um, I, I join you basically in your answer, but interesting was looking especially at the age structure um, in our region. It was what you would have expected somehow that you have an older age in the more rural and looking at the indicators, it was even, it was connected to um, farmland, hiking and even the quite local, um, where is it? Schwäbischer Alpverein was was mentioned. What I when I really had to laugh because it's really um, a club to go hiking on the Swabian Alp for older people, and um, that it was selected here was somehow really unexpected, but also somehow for me proof of the model that such such features because they have like houses to to go to to walk around, and yeah, hiking, um, farmland, and so here that was similar like the um, tax revenue so you, you could understand it how that are how it is related and it's also like um yeah the migration balance is such a softer topic and it's therefore the it's it's harder to, to understand the connections again yeah I have one question. Um, in contrast to Daniel, you have uh, applied basically the same method, but on a very local area, yeah. uh, starting from the hypothesis that OSM is very well mapped, because this has been proven that in Stuttgart it is very well mapped. The, my question is, did you try also to run these in another country or another region of Germany when this is not the truth? And if yes, can you provide some argument on the how sensible it is the completeness or uh, because one of the main issues of OSM is the uneven spatial coverage you know so that has been studied a lot and of course this is a fact so I'm again it's kind of same questions as to Daniel before so how sensible is this to the completeness of the data yeah and, uh, and again I have to say that's exactly the point where we have to re-enter now after this uh, uh, yeah, conference, and that's what we were planning to do, to just apply this model now to other regions with different uh, spatial yeah, distribution and attributes, especially the coverage of OpenStreetMap. To do this on, on the region of Stuttgart, um, the, the reason behind it was exactly that we had some output from the international perspective of the World Risk Index that was definitely uh, of a bad prediction quality because of missing data and this this data um, coverage difference and we didn't have it in, in Stuttgart that's exactly the reason why we um, did it there but many regions in Europe are well covered so we definitely have a chance to apply it elsewhere and then compare this in order to get or make some sensitivity tests of the model and improve the quality at the end or find out what really um, fosters the quality of prediction. And I think it's also going to be quite interesting. Um, I really want to see in, in this term um, if we now take the same model for a different federal state, first of all, does it work the same way? And then if we move to another country, of course, to see um, are there different tags. So in order to, to develop a European indicator set basically for socioeconomic, uh, would we need to have like um, models with validation for each or for what resolution for each country, for each federal state, or could we um, make them robust enough with using one model over more countries, or does the cultural differences reflect upon the tax related to certain age structures? So I think um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to see what's coming up there. Thank you. Any other input from the audience? Okay, so just to close the, the session and before the coffee break, I would like just to make some final remark. Uh, 
Again, coming back to the keynote given yesterday by our OSGEO president, where she basically presented uh, OSM data as the complement to the open source software. We are actually speaking about these two different uh, sides of the same thing. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Maria and Andrea to put actually a, a, a track uh, on, I mean, a, small session on OpenStreetMap uh, in this academic track. I think this should be uh, the, the, the usual uh, and should be actually kept in the future editions of actually any academic track, especially on Phosphor-G. You have seen that as mentioned in the first presentation and as really shown by the second and the third, OSM is really strictly connected to open source. So whenever you want to have some tools to process or to extract something from OSM, you need actually to use Phosphor-G. So we are different communities, but basically we are the same community. Just to close, again, I will invite everyone to attend the academic track at State of the Map conference that will take place in Heidelberg, Germany, Baden-Württemberg, okay, <laughs> right? In uh, three or four weeks, so 21st to 23rd of September. Uh, again, there will be kind of a similar conference to this one, so a general track and then one day of academic track uh, where we will have uh, similar presentations to this one. So you can see really the potential of OSM also for scientific uh, uh, academic applications. So thank you to the speakers and to the audience for this very successful session and wish you all a nice coffee break and nice uh, afternoon and evening. Thank you.